Xin chào các bạn, chào mừng các bạn tới buổi phát sóng của chương trình sự kiện online series trong chuỗi chương trình um, trao đổi các thông tin về phúc lợi động vật cũng như là về thế giới động vật nói chung của phòng phúc lợi động vật tổ chức động vật châu Á. Thì đối với các bạn lần đầu tiên tham dự thì đây là những um, đây là chuỗi sự kiện của phòng phúc lợi động vật và tổ chức xuyên suốt từ năm 2021 và dự kiến sẽ kéo dài tới năm 2022 và chương trình của chúng mình sẽ tổ chức định kỳ hai tuần một lần vào 2 giờ 30 chiều thứ bảy và các chương trình của bên mình cũng sẽ phát lại trên kênh YouTube Animal Welfare Team các bạn có thể tìm kiếm và theo dõi các buổi mà các bạn đã bỏ lỡ và trong thời gian tới thì hy vọng sẽ tiếp tục được nhận sự ủng hộ theo dõi của các bạn À, đối với chương trình ngày hôm nay thì chúng ta sẽ cùng anh Dave New là giám đốc phòng phúc lợi động vật của tổ chức vật châu Á tìm hiểu về việc sử dụng động vật à, vì việc sử dụng công cụ trong thế giới động vật. Thì à, từ trước đến giờ thì chúng ta vẫn thường nghĩ rằng là con người là cái là loài có trí tuệ thông minh và chỉ có con người mới có và cái cái, cái việc sử dụng công cụ sử dụng ngôn ngữ giao tiếp là một trong những cái à, dấu hiệu cho thấy con người có trí tuệ phát triển cao nhất trong thế giới động vật. Tuy nhiên là với sự phát triển của khoa học công nghệ cũng như là sự theo dõi sự của, của cái, các nghiên cứu và các cái quan sát trong thế giới động vật thì chúng ta nhận ngày càng có nhiều bằng chứng rằng các cái loài động vật khác trong thế giới động vật cũng có những khả năng tương tự này và cụ thể ngày hôm nay thì chúng ta sẽ tìm hiểu xem các loài động vật nào có cái khả năng sử dụng công cụ mà chúng ta trước giờ vẫn nghĩ là nó là đặc trưng riêng của con người Nhưng mà trước khi tới với bài thuyết trình của anh Dave thì chúng ta sẽ chúng tôi muốn cho các bạn xem một là bộ phim ngắn về các loài động vật mà cũng được biết tới, được quan sát thấy là có sử dụng công cụ Hey tune in number one to find out animals you had no idea use tools Number 10. Dolphins In 2012, an Indian minister said that dolphins should be treated as non-human people. And scientists have long understood how intelligent these creatures really are. So perhaps it's not surprising that they've recently been observed using tools. Say, what? Well, in Shark Bay, Australia, a scientist was lucky enough to observe how a group of bottlenose dolphins have learned to carry marine sponges in their beaks to stir ocean-bottom sand to uncover prey. This cool technique has made this group more successful at hunting food on the bottom of the ocean. Not only that, but it also protects their noses. Although this is just one group of dolphins, their ability to do this is yet another testament to their intelligence. Though it should be pointed out that it seems to be a relatively new invention. But what's to say there's not another group of dolphins using other sea-based tools for hunting reasons? In fact, as highlighted in a previous video, some scientists have stated that this group spends more time hunting with tools than any other non-human animal. But as we'll see in a moment, there's another contender who others think are slightly ahead of dolphins in using tools. Number 9. Chimpanzees These intelligent creatures made headlines last year when footage emerged showing that the clever primates habitually make special water-dipping sticks. Chewing the end of the stick to turn it into a soft, water-absorbing brush. These sticks were examined by primate researchers and they concluded that they were made specifically for drinking. Apparently using similar brush-tipped sticks to dip into bees' nests for honey was common in chimpanzee populations across Africa. This particular population of chimpanzees has what the researchers call a drinking culture, which they class as a custom shared throughout a group, making these special water-dipping sticks to help them throughout the dry season. But this isn't the only group of chimpanzees to be observed using tools. Decades earlier, in 1960, a chip was observed using a twig to reach one of the chip's favorite foods, termites. He did this by picking up a twig and stripping the leaves off of it. Then, he stuck the twig into one of the holes of the termite mound, left it there for a moment, and slowly pulled it out. So, he was effectively fishing for termites. It's quite clear these intelligent animals have found ways to use tools to overcome difficult situations. Yet, 
Like other species on this list who are at serious risk of extinction due to human action, their tool use won't save them from habitat loss or bulldozers. Number 8. Crows Before we see what crows have to offer, we'd truly appreciate it if you took a moment to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also, it's important that you click that little notification bell too, so you'll always know when there's new content from Zero to Hero. Crows have long symbolized death because they are carrion birds, or birds that feed on dead animals. However, our view and understanding of the crow might just change as the result of a recent observation of a group of captive crows. Ivo Jacobs of Lund University in Sweden and his team were fortunate to observe some interesting behavior in the crows. They saw how one crow slipped a wooden stick into a metal nut and flew off with both objects. Later, they observed another crow insert a thick stick into a hole in a large wooden ball to move the items around the room. As well as these examples, they have also observed four other instances of the crow's clever little tricks. In fact, the ability to use objects to transport both items at once is something that had never been seen in non-human animals. Yet this ingenious feat is not that surprising, as we already knew that crows could use tools. But this particular trick is often seen as a hallmark of complex cognitive abilities, suggesting that they might be a little bit more intelligent than we first thought. At the end of the day, this is definitely interesting, but a lot more research needs to be completed to see whether the birds also use tools this way in the wild. Number 7. Rass So far, we've seen that dolphins can use tools, and that's not too surprising given how intelligent we know they are. But the next example highlights that they aren't the only marine animal to use tools. In fact, this example is the first time tool use has been observed in fish species. This orange-dotted tusk fish likes to eat clams. But how does a fish defeat a clam? Well, it uses a neat trick to expose one buried in the sand. The fish grabs the clam in its mouth and using all of its power, smashes it against coral. The blows are so precise that after a short time, the shell breaks apart. The fish then eats it all up, swallowing the soft flesh and spitting out shattered shell fragments. It just goes to show. Fish might be just a little more intelligent than we give them credit for. Well, this fish at least. Number 6. Orangutans In the wild, orangutans use branches, sticks, and leaves the way humans use utensils, screwdrivers, and power drills. Sticks are the main, all-purpose tool wielded by these primates to pry tasty insects out of trees or for use with certain fruits. Others have been known to use leaves as sort of a glove like when they're picking prickly plants or big leaves as umbrellas in heavy rain. Some have even suggested that some orangutans have been observed using sticks to measure the depth of water. But there's a lot of debate around whether this is the right interpretation for this act. Nevertheless, they are clearly intelligent. But for all their intelligence and their ability to use tools, these beautiful creatures can't possibly defend themselves against humans. And with recent scientific warnings suggesting that they are at risk of imminent extinction by the end of this century, we can only hope that enough is achieved that they might survive in the future. Number 5. Elephants it is no secret that elephants are some of the most intelligent animals on the planet. It's not surprising when you consider the size of their brain and the fact that they pass on information from one generation to the next. So it's not that surprising that they've been observed using tools for a variety of reasons. You have some who've been observed dropping logs on electric fences to short circuit them. Or others, like the Asian elephants, have been observed making fly swatting branches, even modifying the branches so that they are the perfect length. Elephants have a lot going for them, but their intelligence has helped them overcome some difficult situations. Number 4. Gorillas Tools used by gorillas is something scientists has been aware about for some time. Most observations generally relate to obtaining food, either by cracking nuts with rocks or using twigs to eat termites, like we've seen with some other animals on this list. However, recently, tool-savvy wild gorillas were caught on camera. One gorilla was observed using a tool to test the depth of water before wading in it, which could suggest a similar action might have been the right interpretation for our earlier entry with orangutans. In the same video, another gorilla was caught using a stick to help search for food, and even possibly as a bridge over a muddy puddle. Although this is not completely surprising, as tool use in primates is well documented, it is great to catch wild gorillas doing this.
Number 3. Octopus We've already introduced two marine animals that have been known to use tools, and the next example is yet another one to add to the list. The octopus are notorious for their ability to hide behind rocks or slip through the smallest of gaps. Seriously! But groups of octopi, like the coconut octopus, have also been found to use tools. The coconut octopus, Amphioctopus marginatus, is the first identified species to gather materials for its shelter with apparent foresight. While we see this in birds, it is much less known in marine life, especially with octopi. This 2-inch long Indonesian cephalopod has been observed retrieving discarded coconut half-shells, swimming with them up to 50 feet away, and then carefully arranging the shells on the seafloor for later use. In one video, an octopus was caught quickly jumping into its coconut shell. Using the discarded shells in this way allows the soft-bodied creature to hide from predatory cuttlefish and divers who get a bit too close. The coconuts can even be used as a getaway vehicle. The octopuses can roll away from danger safe inside the shell. Number 2. Macaques The next entry on this list has been so successful using their particular tool and method that they have come close to pushing their prey towards extinction. So it appears humans aren't the only primate able to do this, though we obviously do it on a much bigger scale. Long-tailed macaque forage for shellfish on islands off Thailand, then crack them open with some stone tools. They target the largest rock oysters, bludgeoning them with stone hammers, and pry open the shells with the flattened edges of their tools. It's great to see more primates using tools for finding food, but by over-harvesting their prey, they are putting their own technology knowledge at risk. How will they pass on the skills to harvest the food when there's no more food to harvest? Number 1. Sea otters. We mentioned earlier in the video about an animal that makes dolphin tool use look like child's play. Well, it's these cute little creatures. Recent research has indicated that otters learn how to use tools long before other marine animals. A genetic study of more than 100 wild sea otters living off the Californian coast suggests their ancestors living millions of years ago showed this same behavior. So, what do they do? Well, Sea otters are often seen floating on their backs using rocks to break open shellfish for food. In comparison to the dolphin example we discussed earlier, this is not a recent phenomenon. And researchers even plan to study fossil remains to get a better understanding of exactly when they started doing this. If sea otters' ancestors held rocks on their chests, then that may explain the depressions found on the chests of some modern otters. What's even more interesting is that otter pups express rudimentary tool behavior in captivity without any demonstration or training, which could be further evidence for it starting a long, long time ago. Tell us what you think about these brilliant creatures in the comments below, and take care! Hello, I'm Dave Neal, Animal Welfare Director for Animals Asia Foundation, and I'm here today to talk all about animal tool use as part of our One Life presentation series. First of all, if we just look at a definition of what we mean by tool use, now we're going to use this definition for, the, for, the, for this talk, the use of an external object in the attainment of an immediate goal. I'm going to use this one because it's a broader definition which allow, takes into consideration that not all animals have morphological um, adaptations to, be, to, to make tool use easy. So animals without appendages, such as arms and hands, which allow obviously for grasping a lot easier. Um, in this definition, it means that we can look at how other animals like birds and fish also you are, you are using these external objects in the attainment of a goal. And in some cases are actually using fixed objects as the tool in the attainment of, of, of that particular goal. Now we used to say that humans were the exception from all other animals um, due to the fact that we could use tools. And we know now that this, this has been, um, uh, this was challenged in, back in the 1960s really when, with um, Jane Goodall's work with chimpanzees when she first 
documented chimpanzees using tools in the wild. And since then, we've had huge amounts of research now looking at many, many different species to show that tool use is anything but exceptional for humans. And actually, we see it in many, many different animals, which we're going to explore. So tool use is has a behavioural context. It's carried out by animals for a particular reason. In this case, you can see the chimpanzees using their this um, twig as a tool to, to, to maybe get hold of ants or termites. Um, and it can be used for all other all kinds of other things. It can be used to, to obtain water, it can be used for, for grooming, um, it can, tools can be used for defence, as well as to actually help construct things as well. So chimpanzees are very proficient tool users, and there's a few examples that you can see here in terms of how they are using tools, both in terms of um, obtaining, using the stick to, to, to obtain food, such as termites, using stones to crack nuts, um, using sticks as well as a, as a def for defence and for, for threatening behaviours and also using leaves as a sponge to get water. And there's a short video to demonstrate some of these tool uses in chimpanzees. One of the things I find most fascinating about chimps, um, not only the Gombe chimps, but right across Africa is their material culture, meaning their ability to use the stuff around them to make tools to solve problems. There's so many things that chimps do. I mean, I think the repertoire is like 350 different tool uses or more, and I think that's fascinating. In Gombe, nine different chimp tool behaviors have been witnessed. They use twigs to fish for termites out of their mounds. Sticks as probes to get into a tree ant nest or inspect an object. Rocks as hammers to open fruit. And use leaves as a sponge to soak up water to drink. They flail sticks and throw rocks as weapons to intimidate other animals. Or even use sharp sticks as spears. They'll even use vines and sticks to play tug of war or keep away with. Chimpanzee youngsters can learn by observing, imitating, and practicing. They learn by watching their mother, especially, but also brothers, sisters, other individuals in the group. It was in Gombe some 40 years ago that Jane Goodall witnessed tool use for the very first time. This observation was something that no one had ever seen before. Something that changed the way the world viewed not only chimps, but humans as well. I was walking through the vegetation one day and it had been raining and the first six months money I had, which was all I had, was running out. And I knew if I didn't see something exciting before that money ran out, that would be the end. And then I saw this black shape hunched over a termite mound. I peered through my binoculars. I saw a hand reach out, pick a piece of grass, and clearly was using this as a tool, pulling it out from the termite, the, the burrows into the nest, and picking the termites off with his lips. And that was what was supposed to make us most unique at that time. Humans and only humans use and make tools. We were defined as man the tool maker. And so now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as human. We've also seen other primates as well are very efficient tool users. And in, in another case here in capuchin monkeys in South America, and these individuals are using stones to crack up, to crack open these really hard palm nuts. And they need to be able to find the right stone, obviously, to, to, to be able to achieve this. But they also need to make sure that they've got the right 
place where they can place their nuts, so uh, on the ground. So often the use of another stone to make sure that the that the nut stays still when when they hit it again. So um, so problem solving, working out. Um, what tools they need to be able to, to carry out their task. And again, we've got another video to demonstrate this. In the hardest times, there's still a rich source of food for Brazil's capuchin monkeys, palm nuts. One problem, you have to break through the tough outer shell. Young monkeys know the principles, but haven't quite mastered the technique. Frustration sets in and leads to a painful mistake. Young monkeys learn from their mistakes and watch the older males at work. First lesson, test the rock to see if it's strong enough for the job. Not this one. Capuchins can walk upright, and that's important. It frees up the hands to carry the stones. Some rocks weigh more than one-fourth of the capuchin's body weight. It may take more than 10 attempts to crack the nut. Success is not only a matter of intelligence. The larger the monkey, the heavier the stone it can lift. So older males have a real advantage. Success at last. Looking outside of the primates, then there's also some uh, anecdotal evidence of animals which we may not be thinking of, of uh, animals that are possibly use, uh, are users of tools. This particular evidence is looking at cows, and particularly with dairy cows, um, in this case, um, there's been a number of reports of cows that have their calves removed from them as part of the dairy industry, um, so that we can remove their milk for our consumption. These cows actually will spend a lot of time actually calling for their calves after they have been removed. It's a very stressful process for them. Um, but in some cases, it's been reported that these cows, the mothers, will actually go inside of barns with particular acoustic um, properties. So um, particularly with um, um, corrugated iron roofs, which allow that, which amplify, help to amplify the sound. So when they're actually producing their calls, they the calls are, are amplified so they'll go further. And it's thought that this possibly could be in an attempt to try to make their sounds go further to try to reach their cards, which is obviously quite upsetting. 
um, but he's also um, a, an example, a potential example of tool use in cows. Outside of the mammals, then we also see tool use in, in reptiles, in this case, the American alligators. And this has been observed in the, in the wild where alligators will use sticks and twigs to try to, as, to, try to lure um, birds so that they can, so they can capture to eat. And this is particularly seen during um, nest building time. So nest building birds, where the alligate where the birds are coming down to the ground to pick up sticks to make their nests and alligators have been seen just having these sticks and twigs on on their snouts and then just sitting still for many many hours and just waiting for birds to come in the hope that the bird doesn't it, is so preoccupied with finding materials for the nest that it actually then comes close enough for the alligator to be able to to, to be able to pounce and we also see it in invertebrates as well. In this case, the veined octopus. And uh, the veined octopus is likely to carry around things like coconut shells. Um, it does this incredible um, something called stilt walking where it uses its eight legs to be able to actually hold itself up and walk along the sea floor. And it would actually carry these coconut shells for a number of reasons, um, mainly so that it can hide from any predators if a predator comes, but also so that it can hide from any prey and then and then to to, to be able to jump out and catch them. And there's just a short video to show this process. Again, use of an object, an external object, to be able to carry out a, a, a task, in this case, in an invertebrate. In behavioural experiments, we've also now see that animals such as rats are able to, to use tools as well. In this case, then a, a number of rats were actually trained to be able to use a small um, tool with a hook on the end so that they could actually reach a treat which was which was out of reach without the use of the tool and then these rats were presented with two different tools one which had the hook on the end so that they could they could they could reach their their um, food treat and another which had bristles on the end, which when they tried to use it would, wouldn't actually bring the treat closer to them. And it was found that rats would then, in 95% of the time, the rats would actually choose the correct tool. So having an understanding of the need to have this correct tool to be able to reach the food item. As a short video, again, just to demonstrate this.
Again, tool use, tool use being demonstrated in rats. And we also see it in a number of bird species as well. It's particularly interesting, we call it a novel tool use technique in the greater Vassa parrot is, was observed. And this is with the, the use of small pebbles and stones to actually grind shells to be able to grind out the calcium within the shells. This is one of the first examples that we've seen of actually a tool use which is used for grinding, which is something that we as humans do. And these tools, these small pebbles, are often passed between individuals as well. So not only is it an example of tool use, but it's also cooperative tool use with, with a sharing element to it. And other bird species, in this case the goffins cockatoo, has also been seen to not only use tools, but actually to make their own tools as well. So in this particular example, we'll see that a nut is placed on a shelf outside, out, out of the reach of the cockatoo. And the cockatoo then has to actually make its own tool. So it does that from stripping the bark from the wood and then being able to, and using this tool to be able to reach the out of reach food item. So you can see here the cockatoo has worked out that it can't reach the nut and has therefore begun to strip wood from this particular log to be able to reach it. Another example here of it actually manufacturing that, that tool. So it's actually trying to change the shape of that tool so that it works more efficiently. And we see another example here in, in, in this video of tool making. So in this case, these cockatoos were given three different types of materials, each of which they then made their own tools from. So a good example of actually constructing tools for, for, for the purpose needed. And the Goffins cockatoo is also known to be, to be a storer of those tools as well. So once you've made a tool, then it's obviously very useful for you to be able to reuse that tool. And this is something which is not always seen in, in tool using animals. In the case of the Goffins cockatoo, then it has been seen, um, particularly in animals which in places where the tool could easily be lost. So if they're on a higher perch, then it's likely that the cockatoo will do something to try to keep hold of that tool so it doesn't drop down to the floor and they lose it. Or maybe in, you know, if they were in the wild, another bird could actually pick it up and, and use it. So they will either hold it with their, in place with their foot or they will actually, in the case of the behavioural experiments, they will actually put it inside some of these holes where they will store it whilst they're eating their food so that they have that tool to be used again. And one of the birds which is seen to be um, have some of the some of the best problem solving abilities um, is the, the the species of crows and in this case we've seen crows are incredibly proficient tool users in this particular case then these crows are understanding that they need to use a tool to be able to reach a treat which is in water 
and they understand, understand having an understanding of the properties of the of the tool to actually put into the water. So knowing that heavy rocks, when they go into water, they will raise the water level. It won't just sit on the surface and, and float. And by putting these rocks in the water, then they can reach the treat that they are after. And here is a video to demonstrate this. We also see in the wild crows using traffic as a tool, in this case to, to crack nuts, and this is in Japan, where the crows have worked out that they can drop their nuts onto, a, onto the road where the cars will actually crack the nuts for them and then they can go and collect their nuts. And again, here's a video to demonstrate that process. Crows have become highly skilled at making a living in these new urban environments. In this Japanese city, they have devised a way of eating a food that normally they can't manage. Dropping a nut from a great height onto a hard road does sometimes crack it, but some nuts are particularly tough. So the crows have devised a better way. Drop it among the traffic. The problem now is collecting the bits without getting run over. So some birds have refined their technique. They station themselves beside pedestrian crossings. for the lights to stop the traffic. Then collect your cracked nut in safety. Very good problem solving skills there from these, these particular crows. And these skills are seen in many different uh, ways. And in particular, crows are now showing that they can use tools in sequences. So in this particular case, 
this crow has a tool which is too short to be able to reach a food item and drag it towards it. And what it has to do is to get another tool which then will allow it then to reach another tool which is then long enough to be able to reach this food item. And again, there's a video demonstrating this. So you can see here, the, this is the, the tool is, which is too small. So it reaches for another tool. So it uses one of the sticks to get hold of a longer stick. Tries that one. That one's going to be too small as well. So looks for a, a longer stick. Uses that to be able to get hold of this next stick. And that's the stick which then is long enough to bring the treat into reach. Not quite in reach yet. Go back to the stick. And there we go. And that was a three step sequential tool use. This particular crow has been shown to be able to carry out eight separate steps, all of which have to be carried out in a particular order to be able to get to a treat. And I'll let the video explain more. The meat is positioned so deep in the narrow box, it's out of reach of the crow's beak. But Alex has positioned a number of other objects nearby. The question is, can 007 use the tools available to solve the puzzle? Imagine that you're a crow. Here's your food in a deep hole. How would you go about, with the tools available to you on this table, solving this problem? The bird's toolkit includes a short stick hanging on a piece of string, three stones inside wooden cages, and a longer stick trapped in a plastic box. First, the crow must use the short stick to get the stones, and then use all three stones to get the long stick. And now the crows can take this and probe it into the hole and roll, much better than I can, the food out of the hole and get themselves a nice, tasty reward. It's a complicated task. The crow is familiar with the individual pieces of the puzzle. He's done each of them separately for a food reward. But this is the first time he's seen them arranged like this. Eight separate stages that must be completed in a particular order if the puzzle is to be solved. If the bird succeeds, it'll be a world first. He takes time to have a look. And then starts with the short stick. He finds it too short to reach the food. He then sets off to get the first stone. Got it. But he doesn't seem to know what to do with it. And another. He appears to be stuck. Now, something seems to click. He dispatches the first stone. The 
then returns to collect the last one. Got it. The final stage. Success. Eight individual stages complete. The crow performed all eight tasks in the correct order. So a really good example there of tool use, but also incredible problem solving skills as well and being able to use those tools in this particular order. And crows are also known to manufacture their own tools, similar to the Goffin's Copy 2 example. So they will actually manipulate the tool, in particular to try to get a hook on the end if they're trying to reach something which they need to hook to be able to pull out of a, of a log, um, such as a, 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 an insect or a type of invertebrate. And also to store those tools as well, and similar to the Goffin's Copy 2, then they are known, particularly when they're at height, to take more care to store those tools that they've manufactured themselves so that they don't have to keep manufacturing new tools. And again, this is something which obviously we do as humans and that we, when, once we have a good tool, then it's something that we want to continue to, to use time and time again. As an example here of, of the tool manufacturing process. Also see examples now of tool use in fishes as well. In this case, it's the archer fish, and it's actually using water as its tool, and it's a hunting tool. And so the archer fish will look out of the water to see whether there are insects, prey, invertebrates on the leaves which are overhanging the, the rivers and streams where they live, and then they will shoot water out at the, the leaf and at the at the insect hitting the animal and hopefully for the fish, dropping it into the water for them to eat. And this is a particularly, uh, particularly skillful operation because they need to be able to get the right angle um, and also to judge the distortion with which, which you have when you're looking from inside water, outside of the water to make sure that the angle of the the squirt of the water is right as it as it comes out of the water to be able to hit the object and just a short video to demonstrate this <laughs> Oh, 
And other fish species are also known to use tools, in this case, the tusk fish. And here, the tusk fish will get hold of something like a clam, which is too, the shell is too hard for it to be able to crack with it, with it, 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 it using its mouth it's on its own. And so it will actually find a rock as, a, as an anvil, and it will actually use a, a particular rock, which it knows, is, knows has been, is very useful. And then it will thrash the shell up against the rock a number of times until the the shell cracks and it can get to the to the meat inside and again this is the example of a fish using a, a fixed object such as a rock as a tool so to finish then tool use abilities in animals have developed over evolutionary time. So these are skills which animals have developed to be able to cope with the environments that they live within and to be able to give themselves in the sense of a competitive advantage over, over other animals as well. And what we see as we, in, in many cases, then these tool use abilities are passed on through generations, in particular example which is being studied is in Shark Bay in Australia, and this is the use of sponges by dolphins to be able to forage on the on the sea floor, which is very very rough and obviously would cause lots of abrasions in the rostrum of the dolphin. So they put these sponges onto their onto their rostrums, and then they use them to actually. Um, disturb the seafloor in the hope that they can disturb the fish that they that they want to find and eat. And this is something which now being observed, it's passed from generation to generation. In fact, it's passed from along the, the from, from females down into the next female, into the next generation. And so therefore, it's something which is a an example of cultural transmission. And this is something that we see in many animals, as we saw earlier, the animals such as the chimpanzees, which are passing on those skills of being able to use tools to others. And in many cases, then it makes them very specific to certain populations or certain geographies, because those skills have been passed on within that population of animals. And so it's only that population of animals that may actually have learned the skill to be able to use these particular tools. And so from a captivity point of view, then this has welfare implications because animals have certain needs within captivity and particularly animals that have these problem solving abilities and um, have these in inquisitive minds, such as in this case, chimpanzees. We need to be able to provide them with an environment and the resources, have the resources available to them so that they can, can, so they can carry out these tool using abilities, even when they are in captive conditions, such as in, in zoos and safari parks as well. So that's it. Thank you very much from me. I hope through this talk you have uh, learned a little bit more about the what tool use is and the types of animals that are using tools we can see from the examples then tool use is definitely not limited to uh, to, to humans or particularly to to primates or just to mammals but we see tool use in in a number of different species, including in the reptiles, in birds, in fish, but also in the invertebrates. And I'm sure over time, we're going to see lots more examples of tool use in many, many different species. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dave. That's very interesting. And um, yeah, now it's time for Q and A for questions. So if um, yeah, I'll ask if anyone have any question, but we have some already. 
for you. Um, okay. và Thank cảm you. ơn mọi người và bây giờ thì chúng ta sẽ tới tới phần hỏi giải đáp cuối chương trình. Uh, nếu các bạn có câu hỏi thì có thể mở mic hoặc là đánh vào phần chat để mình sẽ trao đổi với anh Dave. Hiện tại chúng ta đã, đã có một số câu hỏi mà tôi sẽ đọc cho anh Dave trước. Dave trước. So Dave, the first question is um, here that we received is that can human teach animal how to use tools? Um, that's a good question. I I suspect we can. Um, I don't have any specific examples which I can think of off the top of my head, but there's a a lot of training which is in which people do with animals regard for in various situations. So with companion animals, mm. and we may be training them to do certain things. In captivity, then there's also a lot of training of, of animals to try to get them to to take medications and mm. you know, perform certain behaviors which are which are good for their welfare. And so it wouldn't surprise me if there are examples of us being able to get animals to actually use a tool to do something that maybe it it hasn't evolved to do. Because I think again, from you seeing from the video, then animals obviously have this very a very cognitively aware and have very good problem solving skills and i mm -hmm. think very easily pick up on the way to do something if it gives them a positive reward thank you à, với câu trả câu câu hỏi này thì anh Dave có trả lời rằng là um, chúng ta cũng còn mặc dù là anh ấy um, hoặc là hiện tại thì chưa có cái um, video nào để chứng minh tuy nhiên là có rất nhiều khả có khả năng lớn là con người cũng có thể uh, uh, dạy động vật cách sử dụng công cụ à, ví dụ như chúng ta huấn luyện chó mèo hoặc vật nuôi chẳng hạn hoặc là à, các cái động vật khác trong việc điều trị thú y hoặc là thực hiện những cái hành vi để chăm sóc cho động vật hoặc mang lại cái lợi ích cho động vật thì đây là có rất là nhiều cái à, cái hình thức mà chúng ta có thể cũng có thể coi là đã đã huấn luyện động vật được right comes to the second question it's um those uh, does tool use cultural and the transmission transmission of tool use across generations um occurs in all species or is is it just unique to primates it's definitely not unique just to primates it's been seen in lots of different species um the video there just ended looking at cultural transmission in dolphins mm -hmm. Uh, so you can see that it, it's happening in other mammals as well. We also see it in some of the birds, in crows, and I suspect we will see it in lots and lots of different animals. It's just that the more charismatic animals like the like the crows and primates and elephants have been studied a lot more mm. than many of the others. And I think the more that we start to look for these particular skills, particularly in the wild, then we will actually see this being transmitted down down the down the family lines in all kinds of fish and invertebrates as well. Just that at the moment, some of that hasn't been documented. Mm -hmm. yeah. à, với câu hỏi này thì anh Dave có nói là chắc chắn là nó không chỉ có xuất hiện ở các cái loài linh trưởng mà như trong video thì chúng ta cũng có thể thấy là nó xuất hiện ở các cái loài động vật khác nữa như là ở cá hoặc là chim hoặc là Uh, rất nhiều các loài động vật khác mà chúng ta có thể quan sát qua từ tự nhiên uh, hiện tại thì các cái quan sát khoa học ấy thì uh, chỉ mới chỉ tập trung vào một số các cái loài uh, động vật mà khá là đặc biệt thôi còn lại uh, khi mà chúng ta mở rộng cái quan sát đó đối với các loài khác đặc, đặc biệt là từ môi trường tự nhiên thì cũng có thể thấy được rất nhiều động vật không sinh sống khác cũng có khả năng truyền uh, truyền tải được các cái um, cách sử dụng công cụ qua các thế hệ sau Okay. Chúng ta có một cái câu hỏi ở trong phần chat của bạn Đỗ Thành Hào. Uh, tôi sẽ xem lại động vật sử dụng công hành viên. Um, we have a question in the in the box and uh, chat box and I'm reading. So animals using tools. Um, so what are the effects of those behaviors um, affect them in captivity and um, in um, rehabilitation and release after that when they are back into the wild what are the the effective 
this is quite quite vague questions not not very clear but to sum up so um with that capacity capacity to use like uh, tools what are the impact of keeping animals in captivity and um yeah in their releasing what is the re relation in um mm. where po at post release yeah i think i think the the relevance with captivity really comes with the fact that tool use is shows that animals have a a lot of cognitive ability to be able to problem solve and to be able to come up with a solution mm -hmm. and so the relevance really with captivity is that often captivity puts animals in very sterile environments where there isn't anything for them to particularly do there isn't any thing for them to particularly solve a problem mm -hmm. to solve so it becomes very boring for them mm -hmm. and that's really something which we need to address we need to provide very complex environments for animals so that they're challenged even in captivity to come up with these solutions for themselves mm. it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to carry out those behaviors but it just means that they're being challenged mm. so that they don't get as bored as mm -hmm. they as they would do if they didn't have that challenge relevance to that to being released i think if you are going to release animals then it's good to make sure that those animals have been cognitively challenged in captivity mm. so that they are then used to trying to come up with solutions novel solutions and problem solved for when they get released back into to their own environment and that's interesting from a sort of conservation and a cultural point of view because yes some animals might be going into certain areas where the the local population has a certain cultural um uh, ability and it would be interesting then to say if, if you're going to release say chimpanzees or macaques or capuchins into that area where it may integrate with others mm. will it it will be useful to expose those individuals to those problem solves and tool use abilities before they're released so that they can integrate well into that population yeah that's a great answer thank you dave um với câu hỏi của bạn ấy thì uh, anh Dave có trả lời rằng là uh, trong với cái hiểu biết của chúng ta về cái um, trí tuệ của động vật về cái cách uh, khả năng sử dụng công cụ ấy, thì uh, chúng ta có thể um, cung cấp um, có thể là đưa ra được cái cái nhận định rằng là trong một cái môi trường nuôi nhốt thì uh, chúng ta cũng nên và cần phải có cung cấp cho động vật những cái um, uh, những cái thách thức để động vật có thể thể hiện được cái khả năng mà giải quyết vấn đề thể hiện được cái trí tuệ của nó và do đó là hầu hết cái vấn đề của cái môi trường nuôi nhốt hiện tại là chưa có được những cái cái hệ thống đưa thách đưa mang lại những cái thách thức cho động vật để động vật có thể thể hiện những cái việc việc đó đó là những cái môi trường nuôi nhốt cần phải um, cân nhắc về cái vấn đề này và đối với những động vật mà trong quá trình mà uh, phục hồi và có thể trở lại thả, tái thả lại tự nhiên sau này thì Uh, chúng ta trong quá trình chăm sóc phục hồi đó thì cũng phải uh, cân nhắc về cái việc uh, cung cấp cho động vật những cái uh, kỹ năng để nó phát triển và duy trì những cái thách thức đó đặc biệt cần cân nhắc tới cái môi trường và cái ở đây anh sử dụng cái từ văn hóa tại vì trong thế giới động vật nó cũng có cái cái um, văn hóa ở tùy cái cái khu vực động vật tái thả thì nó có những cái nhóm động vật địa phương ở đó sinh sống và và nó cũng có những cái hành vi khá là đặc trưng ở khu vực đó thì Um, khi mà chúng ta xác định được cái khu vực động sẽ tái thả về đó thì cần phải um, có những cái um, hình thức phục hồi và để thách thức um, cho động vật để chúng có thể hòa nhập được với cái nhóm động vật địa phương đó và thì đây là cái um, câu trả lời cho câu hỏi của bạn okay. uh, bạn Huỳnh Trần Huy có giơ tay phát biểu thì bạn có thể mở mic để hỏi cũng được ạ Ok, uh, good afternoon Dave and good afternoon everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting presentation and some video about the animal. Uh, I have some questions for you. Uh, the first question I want to ask, uh, how would you rate the ability and the intelligence between the two groups of animal that have tune attached to their body part when they were born and do that how make tune for themselves thank you sorry i don't completely understand which which animals yes 
À, bạn, à, bạn có thể nói giải thích rõ hơn một chút. Ý của bạn là là có thể so sánh cái sự khác biệt giữa cái nhóm động vật mà khi sinh ra và đã có được cho dùng công cụ hay là sao? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, his question is um, is there a comparison um, uh, like available for two two group of animals uh, of the same species and one was born like exposed to tools um, different tools in their environment or close to where they are and others in a more barren um, yeah environment oh okay um i don't think there's been any specific examples that i'm aware of where that's been done looking specifically at tool use but i think there's lots of examples where we've got animals which have you can see different populations of animals which one which have grown up in a very natural complex environment and then others which have grown up in a very barren environment where they're not being mm. challenged or they don't have any resources to be able to come up with solutions mm. and i think yeah the you know the results from that show that the animals which are in the barren environment are very much more stressed or you know suffer more in terms of just just general frustration and boredom than the animals which are in the more co cognitively complex environment mm. i hope Wait. that explains với câu hỏi của bạn Huỳnh Trấn Huy thì chúng tôi hiểu rằng là à, bạn đang muốn hỏi về sự so sánh là động vật được uh, chăm sóc ở trong hai cái môi trường khác nhau một một uh, môi trường là uh, động vật có rất là nhiều cái công cụ để sử dụng và một môi trường là động vật không có cái công cụ đó thì uh, cái sự phát triển giữa hai cái nhóm đấy nó khác nhau như nào thì hiện tại thì chưa có nhiều cái chưa có cái nghiên cứu cụ thể như thế về việc sử dụng uh, sự khác biệt giữa hai nhóm sinh ra trong môi trường khác nhau như thế tuy nhiên là Um, khi mà quan sát động vật uh, ở trong cái thế giới tự nhiên mà có rất là nhiều cái điều kiện mà động vật uh, có thể sử dụng các công cụ khác nhau thì và so sánh với cái nhóm động vật mua trong môi trường dẫn, uh, nuôi nhốt chẳng hạn là có rất ít cái cái um, yếu tố để mà động vật uh, kích thích cho động vật phải sử dụng những cái trí tuệ của mình thì uh, cho có cái sự khác biệt rằng là động vật trong môi trường mà không có nhiều cái yếu tố kích thích thì sẽ bị căng thẳng nhiều hơn và và có những cái vấn đề về tâm lý nó bất bình thường hơn thì không biết có phải là uh, hy vọng bạn và uh, trả lời cho câu hỏi của bạn. Okay, yeah. thank you so much for your answer and the second question of me is uh, for animals that are researched in the zoo or in the sanctuaries, uh, should they learn to use tool naturally or they need the human to guide them what do you think about yeah again that's a very good question and i think um it, again it really comes down to whether they have the adults in their environment to be able to teach them to use those tools um and whether they have the ability to and the adults have the ability to do that so in the case of the chimpanzees which you saw where there's an artificial termite mound and sticks provided then the youngsters will watch the adults doing that and then will learn that but in an environment where that's not available then the adults won't be able to do that so the youngsters won't be able to learn that as well so i think that is a crucial thing in that if we know that animals have those problem solving abilities then we should present them with the challenges in their captive environment to allow them to do that and then to teach that to other generations and particularly if we're looking at conservation and potentially some of these animals in future generations being released back into the wild we need to ensure that those abilities continue to be passed on through the generations so that when we get to the ones that may be released into the wild it's still a skill which they already have within their population mm. À, bạn Huỳnh Trần Huy cũng có đưa ra một câu, câu hỏi thứ hai là à, với các động vật trong sở thú chẳng hạn hoặc các ở trong các cái môi trường thí nghiệm thì à, liệu là à, có con người có 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 nên dạy động vật đó hoặc động vật có thể à, tự à, có phát triển cái kỹ năng sử dụng công cụ hay không ấy? thì câu trả lời của anh Jeff đó à, trả lời là nó tùy thuộc vào cái môi trường đó liệu có những cái cá thể à, động vật trưởng thành mà 
có cái kỹ năng sử dụng động uh, công cụ và sau đó thì um, truyền đạt lại kỹ năng đó cho những con non trong đàn hay không thì uh, nói việc này thì um, đặc biệt đối với những cái động vật mà sau này sẽ tái thả trở lại môi trường tự nhiên thì mà um, thì những cái động vật sinh sản trong môi trường nuôi nhốt thì uh, có thể là um, cần có những động vật lớn hơn trưởng thành hướng dẫn cho những con non đó về cái kỹ năng sử dụng công cụ và do đó là khi là những con 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 non mà có khả năng À, đặc biệt nhất những cái cơ sở mà sinh sản bảo tồn và sau này sẽ thả tái thả những động vật non trở về môi trường tự nhiên thì cần à, phải kết hợp à, phải à, ghép nhóm những cái cá thể mà sử dụng công cụ và à, có khả năng sử dụng cụ biết cách sử dụng công cụ để dạy cho những con non đó để tăng cái khả năng sinh tồn cho những cái cá thể non sau này sẽ được tái thả lại. Okay. Uh... Yeah. Uh... Thank you so much, Dave, for your sharing and answering my uh, question. Yes, thank, thank you. you for your sharing today. Cảm ơn, Huy. Uh, let's come to the next question uh, from Hoa Trường. He asked, will the future generations know how to use more tools in the case of species that can teach their children? I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is just something that, again, we're still learning as we observe more animal behaviors and spend more time actually researching animals, particularly within the wild. So I'm pretty sure that we're going to find out a lot more about animal tool use and we're going to see novel new tool uses that animals are coming up with and problem solving within their particular environment. A lot of what we currently have is animals in captivity, so we're challenging animals in, in behavioural research to see whether they can mm. use those tools, such as the, the rats with the, with the hooks and a lot of the crow examples are all done in, you know, a lot of that is done in, in behavioural research laboratories. Mm. And we're going to find more examples where, you know, animals are kind of mind-blowingly finding these ways to do, to solve problems. But ultimately, they're already doing that out in the wild. We just don't always get the opportunity to observe it. So the more we observe them, I think the more we're going to learn about it and the more tool use we'll find. It. Yeah, and the crow with um, dropping the nuts is a very good example. Yeah. I'd be amazed. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, câu hỏi của bạn Khoa Trương rằng là với xét được các loài có thể dạy cho các con non các thế hệ sau kỹ năng sử dụng công cụ thì các thế hệ tương lai đó có biết sử dụng nhiều công cụ hơn hay không thì câu trả lời của anh Dave là um, chắc chắn là có thì um, hiện tại thì chúng ta với mới chỉ um, quan sát rất là ít về về thế giới động vật để mà đưa ra những cái kết luận về sử dụng công cụ và hầu hết những cái quan sát đó thì được đang được sử dụng trong cái môi trường tự, tự nhiên à, môi trường um, nuôi nhốt và môi trường thí nghiệm có, có điều kiện thôi và khi mà chúng ta quan sát ở môi trường tự nhiên thì sẽ có, chắc chắn sẽ có rất là nhiều cái cái bất ngờ và à, những cái về những à, kỹ năng hay những cái à, công cụ khác nhau mà động vật có thể sử dụng được và không chỉ một loài mà còn rất là nhiều loài nữa khi chúng ta mở rộng cái thế giới quan sát của mình thì cũng tương tự như cái ví dụ mà các cái loài quả mà à, trong uh, tự nhiên thì biết cách là thả cái hạt xuống uh, trong uh, trên đường xe cộ và thậm chí là còn quan sát cái ở những cái chỗ mà người lối đi bộ và để an toàn hơn nữa thì uh, khi mà chúng ta mở rộng cái, cái uh, quan sát thí nghiệm của mình thì chúng ta sẽ thấy được rằng công cụ ở động vật có sẽ có cái, cái kỹ năng sử dụng công cụ nhiều hơn okay. right. Think uh yes that's uh as many questions that we have so far right okay. uh, i'll ask if um there's one wants to add more question here now uh, otherwise uh uh không biết có bạn nào hiện tại có có câu hỏi nữa không this one just pop up um if as we have been seeing that animals are very intelligent and Possibly, we are seeing more animals uh, being a intelligent animals, and they might get more intelligent over the years, over the time. Um, should we encourage that intelligence, or should we keep them in like uh, like how they are now, or restrict that? Um, I don't think we can contain the abilities of, of animals in that way particularly in wild animals um, 
I think that's just something which you know the evolutionary process is well is continuing right in front of us. So animals in the wild continue to evolve and to to learn new skills and to pass those skills on to onto other generations. Containing it would mean only controlling what we have in captivity, which again goes back to that point that we said before, which really is morally quite wrong to do because mm. you're then preventing animals from doing something which they have a cognitive ability to do so no i don't think there is any reason to contain it and and yeah there isn't any reason why we would you know it's mm. not like you know unless we're concerned that animals are going to some, some species is going to suddenly take over the and, and dominate humans and take over us as the sort of the, you know the, the dominant species then i don't think there's any reason why we would do anything to um, in fact we should be doing the opposite encouraging the ability for animals to express themselves as much as possible and to learn those abilities ừ. thì um, với câu hỏi bạn Nguyễn viết là liệu chúng ta có uh, phát hiện động vật ngày càng thông minh hơn thì nên khuyến khích hay là nên giữ sự tiến hóa ở mức an toàn đó thì uh, câu trả lời của anh Chê uh, uh, về um, có lẽ có lẽ là chúng ta nên nên khuyến khích và bởi vì chúng ta như chúng ta quan thấy thì động vật vẫn đang tiến hóa ở một môi trường tự nhiên và sẽ ngày càng tiến hóa hơn theo thời gian nữa thì chúng ta không có lý do gì về để mà và cũng không có khả năng ấy, để mà ngăn chặn cái cái sự tiến hóa đó và xét về mặt đạo đức ấy, thì chúng ta cũng không có có quyền gì cũng không um, um, sai sẽ sẽ là rất là sai trái khi chúng ta cản trở cái sự tiến hóa của tự nhiên um, và động vật cũng sẽ vẫn tiến hóa theo cái cách mà tự nhiên để đặt đặt, đặt ra thì uh, trừ khi là chúng ta có những cái mối um, lo ngại rằng một ngày nào đó sẽ có cái loài động vật nào đó sẽ phát triển um, hơn và có cái trí tuệ trí tuệ cao hơn động vật và sẽ thay thế con người trở thành cái loài mà thống trị hành tinh này tuy nhiên là cái um, cái việc đó thì cũng uh, uh, nó cũng sẽ diễn ra một một cách rất là tự nhiên thôi. bạn nào có câu hỏi nào nữa không thì các bạn có thể mở vào phần chat hoặc là mở mic để trao đổi ạ. Chúng tôi cũng có thấy là bạn Jun có một câu hỏi với um, Ok. So we have another, another question that's in the box but the chat sent directly to the host. Um, so the question is um, there are humans there are people who only who consider animals are just nonsense and um with no like sentience and no feelings and are just um tools for animals to use um so there are any are there any like angle for them to like open their uh, perspective and um change their mind and see animals as the like sentient beings and uh, have less um, harmful act um, to, mm. to them. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for all of us which are involved in animal protection is trying to change the mindset of some people and therefore change their behavior. Mm. And I think trying to put information out like we're doing in these series of talks is helpful trying to disseminate that information to as many people as possible i know it's difficult because generally the people that probably come and listen are the ones that already support animals and animal protection but you know it's up to us to find ways to try to get that information out as much as possible mm. um, to those audiences that may not normally be exposed to this kind of information mm -hmm. um, in the hope that some of those people will then look at start to explore that a little bit more uh, thoroughly for themselves and come to the same conclusion that actually yes you know all animals regardless of, of, of which type of animals are are sentient and you know have these emotional cognitive abilities and therefore then come to their own decision to to change their own behaviors and, and act much more responsibly and morally towards those animals but it's a very difficult thing to do <laughs> yeah thank you Um, bạn Jun thì có một câu hỏi rằng là uh, có những người chỉ coi động vật là nói vô tri và sử dụng lạm dụng cho mục đích riêng và uh, vậy thì có cái cách tiếp cận hay đàm thoại nào để mở, mở rộng góc nhìn của họ và 
à, hy vọng là không hy vọng là sẽ thay đổi họ hoàn toàn nhưng ít nhất họ biết thêm về cái nhìn nhận mở rộng cái nhìn nhận của họ về về động vật và giảm bớt những cái hành vi tiêu cực hướng tới động vật và điều chỉnh theo hướng tích cực hơn thì câu hỏi của bạn thực tế là nó làm cái vấn đề mà trong của của cả cái 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 lĩnh vực bảo, của những người hoạt động bảo vệ, bảo vệ động vật này thì đúng là có những những, những um, quan điểm nó vẫn là, vẫn còn rất là khá là hạn chế nữa dựa trên cái cái um, truyền, những cái điều mà mọi người được dạy chỉ bạn chỉ dạy cho hoặc là những cái suy nghĩ hạn chế đó thì uh, những một trong những cái hoạt động mà chúng tôi đang làm như hiện tại về trong những cái buổi nói chuyện hoặc những cái trao đổi uh, chia sẻ kiến thức về thế giới động vật này thì còn đó là một trong những cái cách để uh, hy vọng rằng là mọi người có thể um, mở rộng thêm cái hiểu biết của mình. Tuy nhiên là các bạn đã tới tham dự cái chương trình của chúng tôi thì ít nhiều các bạn cũng có những cái uh, mối quan tâm hoặc là cái tình yêu thương động vật và có cái góc nhìn tương đối là khác so với những người đó rồi. Tuy nhiên là uh, một cái cách thức khác nữa là chúng ta làm sao để uh, truyền đạt lại những cái thông tin mà các bạn tiếp nhận được chia sẻ thông qua những cái uh, hình thức trao đổi này để uh, thay đổi cái góc nhìn của những người khác nữa mà chưa tham dự hoặc chưa có cơ hội biết tới những chương trình này Thế đây là một cách mà chúng tôi nghĩ là có thể cách tiếp cận <cười> right. um, Hoa Trương has another question that um, he, has, he ha has watched videos of orangutans copying human um, behavior so what can we teach them more useful survival skills Um, and if they can learn these so not so natural skill, will they also teach their children uh, those skills? For example, if orangutan can understand how use how to use boats in Borneo, uh, will they teach their um, children? Thank you. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, as you say, then these things do get passed down with uh, individuals teaching their youngsters to be able to do things or at least if it's not directly teaching then the youngsters watching the adults doing it so the process of social learning where a youngster will just observe an adult doing something and then continue to try to do that themselves so i do think it is possible that we can teach animals to do things ourselves purposefully so that they have a better chance of surviving when they go back out into the wild and then those skills to be passed on it certainly is something which is a a tool for conservationists to consider particularly those which are involved in rehabilitating animals back into ừ. the wild. Ừ. Thì uh, bạn uh, Khoa Trương có câu hỏi rằng là bạn đã xem được các video về uh, cái loài uh, dã nhân tính, uh, đuổi ươi và uh, học được các hành vi của con người ví dụ như là ở đảo Borneo thì những loài động vật đó biết sử dụng thuyền để di chuyển liệu chúng ta có thể dạy những động vật đó có những cái kỹ năng mà có thể hữu ích cho cái sinh tồn của cái loài đó trước cái điều kiện hiện tại hay không thì anh Dave có trả lời là có thể là đây là một cái hướng mà các nhà bảo tồn cũng có thể cần cân nhắc tới trong cái công tác công việc của họ hiện tại để bảo tồn cái loài này vì với cái, cái kỹ năng ở thế giới tự nhiên thì khi một động vật trưởng thành sử dụng một cái công cụ nào đó và có khả có hiệu quả thì sẽ những cái con non ở trong cái đàn đó sẽ sẽ học được cái cái cái, cái cách sử dụng công cụ và sẽ um, tiếp tục uh, phát triển sử dụng tái sử dụng những cái công cụ đó thì um, đây là một cái điều mà nó diễn ra tự nhiên và có thể là um, hiệu quả trong um, trong cái bối cảnh mà cái xung đột hay là cái môi trường nó dần dần thay đổi và động vật có lẽ là cần thêm nhiều kỹ năng khác để có thể sinh tồn tốt hơn. Cảm ơn câu hỏi của bạn. Okay. Thank you Dave. Rồi, chúng tôi sẽ tiếp nhận thêm một câu hỏi nữa nên là nếu các bạn nào có câu hỏi thì uh, muốn đặt ra thì các bạn có thể mở mic trực tiếp. Okay. I just shout out for one last question. But uh, yeah, considering we uh, we have a small group today, and uh, yes, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people got um, kicked down in when that um, happened previously. So thank you so much, Dave, for your time and um, for sharing very You're interesting welcome. videos. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks very much to everybody for for listening. Um, and yeah, hope to see you again soon. Okay. Cảm ơn anh Jay và cảm ơn các bạn đã dành thời gian uh, tham dự với nhóm chúng tôi buổi chiều ngày hôm nay. Thì uh, buổi này sẽ chúng tôi sẽ điều chỉnh lại phần đầu tiên và sau đó sẽ post lại trên kênh YouTube và các bạn có thể xem lại. Cảm ơn mọi người. Okay. Thanks, Dave, and bye, everybody. Goodbye.